So Moss will speak now in his second presentation and uh, on the topic of uh, demasking the Bandera lobby research on the OUNB and its role in the Ukraine conflict. So thank you for that already. Please, Moss, the floor is yours. Well, hello again. Um, going to wait for the presentation to get queued up. But I will say, um, to start, one of the reasons that I'm so especially grateful for all of you being here and for Jungewelt and Melody and Rhythmus and especially Suzanne Wittstahl for putting this all together is, um, you know, there are journalists in the United States who respect me as a researcher and whatnot, but, and they'll give me credit and when necessary, but um, when it comes to the very basic fact that I try to raise awareness of that the OUNB, Bandera's organization, still exists, there's, they won't mention it. So I'm, Jungewelt is, to my knowledge, the only publication in the world um, that has helped me to bring awareness of this fact, which you think is very basic, but... Uh. So, what do I mean when I talk about the Bandera Lobby. This is my nickname for the International OUNB Network, which, as I mentioned, still exists. And to those who would say it doesn't exist, um, I'd like to know when they think it stop ceased to exist. And they can't tell you, except to say that this is all Russian propaganda, conspiracy theory, blah, blah, blah. Um, toward the end of my first presentation, I mentioned the organizations of the Ukrainian Liberation Front, which referred to the many front groups or facade structures that the Banderites established during the Cold War. Fifty years ago, in October 1973, the OUNB created the World Ukrainian Liberation Front, which you see here, an above-board international coordinating body of these front groups, and the Defense Fund of Ukraine, also known as the OUN Fund, which only went public as an organization earlier this year. Since 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed and Ukraine became independent, the Liberation Front has changed its name several times. First, they called it the Organizations of the Ukrainian State Front, then the Coordination Council of State Organizations, the Conference of Ukrainian State Organizations, and finally, the World Council of Ukrainian State Organizations. Rarely did these names appear in English, or maybe even in German for that matter. Um, in the past decade or so, they started to call it, only in English, the International Council in Support of Ukraine, which sounds much less suspicious. But to make things easier, I will uh, continue to call it the World Ukrainian Liberation Front. I would just like to note, going back to this old debate, um, whether or not the OUN is fascist, one argument made by the nationalists in the 1930s was that they could not be considered fascists because fascism requires a state. Well, once the Ukrainians had a state, the Banderites started to call themselves state builders as they moved on to their next long-term goal, the development of a strong nationalist Ukraine allied with the West against Russia. Of course, the OUNB has even more ambitious dreams, starting with the disintegration of Russia. As for greater Ukraine, expanding the borders of Ukraine beyond what they were in 1991, this is obviously just a fantasy, but it's one that still lives in the OUNB. For example, take Russ Balance, old neighbor, Bogdan Fedorak, who directed the Ukrainian Cultural Center in Warren, Michigan, and chaired the World Ukrainian Liberation Front in the 1980s. In 1992, Fedorak wrote um, an article for a newspaper in Ukraine in which he said, quote, the present borders of Ukraine are the borders of the former USSR established by the authorities in Moscow. Almost one third of all the ancient ethnographic territories settled from time immemorial by the Ukrainian nation lie beyond the borders of Ukraine. Ukraine cannot renounce, including these lands, 
and those Ukrainian people in the Ukrainian nation. Now, Russ was a little too modest to tell you that thanks to him, Fedorak was exposed as the, quote, top OUNB leader for external affairs in the United States, and he had to resign as the chairman of Ukrainians for Bush in 1988. But Bogdan Fedorak was more than that. In 1986, after the death of Yaroslav Stetsko, leader of the OUNB and anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations, ABN, Fedorak succeeded him as the chairman of the so-called Ukrainian national government, which, at least on paper, was a Banderite government in exile that originated in the OUNB's pro-Nazi declaration of statehood in German-occupied Western Ukraine. Fedorak held that position until he died in 2021. Today, the World's Ukrainian Liberation Front, or International Council in Support of Ukraine, is chaired by Fedorak's mentee, Boris Potopenko, who hails from the same suburb of Detroit, Michigan. Like many of the elder leaders of the OUNB network in the Ukrainian diaspora today, Potopenko cut his teeth politically as a young person going to conferences of the anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations, this is him, and the World Anti-Communist League. In the late 1970s, he led a campaign against the NBC, or National Broadcasting Company, airing a television miniseries about the Holocaust because it depicted Ukrainian collaboration with the Nazis. In 1995, Potopenko predicted, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the next imperialist structure to undergo a similar process will be what is known today as the Russian Federation. The ABN, anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations, dissolved months later. But Potopenko said that such an organization would still be needed to champion, quote, the national rights of the countries in the internal Russian empire struggling to achieve their independence. More recently, Boris Potopenko was one of the leaders of the so-called capitulation resistance movement in Ukraine, which the OUNB organized after Zelensky was overwhelmingly elected in 2019 on a peace platform, threatening to overthrow him, or worse, if he pursued negotiations with Russia. In the immediate aftermath of the 2019 election results, Serhii Parkomenko, an OUNB member in Ukraine, who helped to organize this so-called resistance movement, told the journalists from the US, we are going to raise a new Maidan revolution if Zelensky makes a single step away from our course. Parkomenko is another advocate of greater Ukraine. But before I tell you more about the contemporary OUNB in Ukraine, and especially its role in the so-called Maidan revolution of 2014, the government that subsequently came to power in Kiev and this resistance movement against Zelensky, I think I should use the first half of this presentation to give an overview of this international OUNB network, or the Bandera Lobby. So because this is a German audience, let's start with the OUNB network in Germany. Although I must admit um, that I do not know a lot about this. And from what I can tell, it appears to be on its last legs. Just because you have a million Ukrainian refugees does not mean that the OUNB will have a revival here. In fact, this could spell the end of the organization in Germany. Since the 1990s in the Ukrainian diaspora, the OUNB has done a terrible job at recruiting new arrivals from Ukraine and the former Soviet Union. Generally speaking, the Banderites do not want them in their organizations, if only because with their numbers and motivated spirits, uh, they would inevitably take over. So perhaps when the OUNB is finally extinguished in Germany, some newer arrivals will be invited to rebuild this network. Um, this is the headquarters building of OUNB in Munich, or the, the Cold War headquarters. Um, from what I heard, they sold this building some years ago, um, but I'm not sure about that. So earlier this month, the OUNB announced the death of one of its German leaders, Andriy Kutsan, who married the daughter of Stepan Bandera. Um, she died many years ago. 
but, and Kutsan was apparently responsible for taking care of Bandera's grave in Munich. In that city, the birthplace of Nazism, the OUNB had its headquarters during the Cold War, which also served as the headquarters of the anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations, led by Yaroslav Stetsko, and later his wife, Sava Stetsko, who led the OUNB in the 1990s after he died. In accordance with a decree from Ukrainian President Viktor Yushchenko, and his wife, uh, Katerina Yushchenko, is another Banderite from the Midwestern United States, Chicago, that knew the Stetskos well and attended conferences of the Anti-Bolshevik Bloc of Nations and World Anti-Communist League. Um, so on a decree from the President Yushchenko, a memorial plaque to honor the Stetskos was installed on the ground floor of this building in Munich. The unveiling ceremony was held in January 2009, which included speeches from Andriy Kutsan and Ukraine's Consul General in Munich. We pay tribute to the living deeds of Yurasov and Slava Stetsko and commemorate them, said the representative of Ukraine's government. Also making a speech was a leader of the Congress of Ukrainian Nationalists, a far-right political party in Ukraine founded by Slava Stetsko. Later that year, Banderites from around the world made a pilgrimage to Munich for the 50th anniversary of Stepan Bandera's assassination by the KGB. And now I'd like to play a clip from a memorial concert in Munich that um, has since been scrubbed from the internet. And maybe just one moment. I call them the Bandera Youth. Um, and this is an international organization which also has a branch in Germany. Hold on. Okay. In recent years, as I said, the Banderites allegedly sold their building in Munich, but their most important facade structure, front group, in Germany still uses the same address, Zeppelinstrasse 67. I am talking about the so-called Ukrainian Institute of Educational Policy, which is registered as a co-owner of the contemporary OUNB headquarters building in Kiev. It is plausible that this German organization played a role in shaping nationalist educational policy in Ukraine during 2014 to 2016, when an OUNB member, Serhii Kvit, led the Ministry of Education. More about Kvit later, but real quick, I will tell you this about him. An admirer of the fascist ideologue Dmitro Donsov, Kvit was a leader of the capitulation resistance movement against Zelensky. And as education minister, he had at least a few advisors from the OUNB, one of them being the advocate of greater Ukraine that said, we are going to raise a new Maidan revolution if Zelensky makes a single step away from our course. Anyway. The head of this Ukrainian Institute of Educational Policy in Munich is Andriy Haidemaka, who served as the international leader of OUNB from 2000 until 2009. This is not speculation, it's an indisputable fact. Haidemaka is very interesting. Born in Belgium, he became the first OUNB leader from the Ukrainian diaspora. From 1973 to 82, he edited the OUNB newspaper, Way of Victory, uh, in Munich. For the next 10 years, he worked for Radio Svoboda, also in Munich, that is, the Ukrainian language service of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, RFERL, the US-funded propaganda outlet, which was established by the Central Intelligence Agency. As I mentioned before, the CIA didn't directly support Bandera, but his wartime deputy and Cold War rival, Michael Labed. It was under the Reagan administration that Banderites like Haidemaka 
finally found employment in RFERL, potentially signaling a shift in U.S. support, or at least the beginning of one. In 1992, Haida Maka actually co-founded the Kiev Bureau of Radio Svoboda, which he directed until 2000, when he succeeded Slava Stetsko as the next OUNB leader. This is not the only clue, but one of the most obvious ones, that at the turn of the, 20 at the, turn of the 21st century, the light turned bright green in Washington to support the Bandera cult. The other obvious clue brings us to the United States and Washington itself, where in 2000, months after Haida Maka ascended to the Banderite throne, if you will, the OUNB established a new front group in the United States, the Center for U.S.-Ukrainian Relations, or CUSER. According to its website, CUSER was designed to provide a set of informational platforms or venues for senior level representatives of the political, economic, security, and diplomatic establishments of the United States and Ukraine to exchange views on a wide range of issues. Every year, it organizes multiple policy conferences in Washington and New York. The list of speakers over the years reads like a who's who list of policymakers and war hawks. That being said, there tends to be a recycling cast of experts from influential think tanks such as the Atlantic Council, which many consider to be the unofficial think tank of NATO. Regulars at these conferences include retired U.S. generals Ben Hodges, Wesley Clark, and Philip Breedlove, some of the most vocal proponents of extremely reckless escalation by the United States and NATO in Ukraine. But to give you a better picture of this organization, let me tell you about CUSER's first ever conference in September 2000. Care to guess who chaired the steering committee that organized this event? None other than Bogdan Fedorak, who led the OUNB's so-called Ukrainian national government. And what was this event called? Ukraine's quest for mature nation statehood. And whose responsibility was it to keep our very ambitious agenda running on time? Boris Potapenko, his mentor, also from Detroit. So perhaps it will not surprise you to hear that OUNB members and friends of the Bandera lobby dominated the steering committee, as always, including Stephen Bandera, the Canadian grandson of you-know-who. So according to the website of CUSER, this organization grew out of the informational arm of the Ukrainian American Freedom Foundation, which is another facade structure that according to OUNB documents in my possession here, owns 40% of the OUNB headquarters building in Ukraine, and quite literally is the financial arm of the OUNB leadership in the United States. Walter Zaritsky, also known as Waz, has been the executive director of CUSER since day one, and today is president of this foundation. Unless things have changed in the past year due to my constant promotion of this fact, Zaritsky is the so-called land leader of OUNB in the United States. I want to play another clip for you to let Zaritsky introduce himself, but first a quick funny story. In 2021, I confronted Waz Zaritsky about the rumor that he was in the running to be the next uh, international leader of OUNB. His response, which sounded more like confirmation than denial, was to accuse me of colluding with maintenance people from the cable company to bug their US headquarters building in Manhattan so I can listen in on their secret meetings. He also confirmed that he believed a wild conspiracy theory that somewhere in this building, his Banderite rivals in the United States were secretly mining Bitcoin, which he apparently understood to be an instrument of Russian intelligence services. So maybe we could play that next clip. The books you start seeing about the Nazi hunt throughout the United States, we picked up on those books and we started looking every single one of those books. Guess what? They've been all sorts of rumors. Oh, yeah, they killed Poles. No, no, they killed Jews. They, no, they killed the, the Russians. No, they killed this. Guys. They're trying to devastate us altogether in terms of our power. Today, I'm going to be dealing with a subject that's rather sensitive in the Ukrainian community. 
This is Simon Wiesendorf. Now, this is between us. We're all Ukrainians. Simon Wiesenthal, the legendary Nazi hunter. We're going to go after Wiesenthal also. Quietly. Not as a Jew, but as a Soviet agent, which is what he was. This SOB, and I will say this on camera, this SOB fought against our partisans. They end up creating a partisan army, and I know that they've been all sorts of rumors. Oh yeah, they killed Poles. No, no, they killed Jews. They, no, they killed the, the Russians. No, they killed this. Guys. But someday, if we can find some info on him and his relationship to Charlie Allen, so we can get back to Charlie Allen. A journalist in the 1960s by the name of Chuck Allen, he had written these exhaustive exposés uh, on the existence of Nazis in the United States. He also held rallies to, to draw attention to the problem. Charlie would be one hell of a guy to get rid of because he had a lot of friends. Allen has done us more damage than any single person. We even have his address and telephone number. What do you think we should... No. <laughs> Not on camera. Not on camera. In the same lecture from 1989, he goes in great detail about how much he hates Russ Ballant and how much problems he caused the Banderites in the United States. Um, and that the full video of that's on YouTube. Um, but So let's go back to that first QSER event, because I haven't told you yet about its speakers, sponsors, and patrons. Okay. As for the speakers, here are some names that I assume need little, need little to no introduction. Zbigniew Brzezinski, former National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter. Paul Wolfowitz, the famous neocon and architect of the Iraq War. Uh, Mitch McConnell, the powerful Republican Senator from Kentucky. And Michael McFowl, uh, President Barack Obama's dangerously inept ambassador to Russia. There was also John Lenchovsky, former advisor to Ronald Reagan, who founded the Institute of World Politics, a private graduate school in Washington, D.C., which is actually a far-right feeder school for the CIA and other intelligence agencies. Um, this school has the, the private library of the American Security Council, which Russ told you all about. Another speaker was Sandy Levin, a Democratic congressman from Michigan and co-founder of the Congressional Ukraine Caucus, which co-sponsored this event. In his opening remarks, Levin said, you know, in Congress, we often start by indicating a conflict of interest. In this case, I have to co uh, confess a strong compatibility of interest. Boris Potapenko mentioned that he's from Michigan, as well as Bogdan Federak. So we're strong and close pals. And here is Federak and Potapenko with his brother, Senator Carl Levin, who also spoke at conferences of the ABN so forth. So, um, sponsors of this QSER event in 2000 included not only the Embassy of Ukraine and the U.S. Library of Congress, but several U.S.-funded organizations charged with promoting democracy around the world. Freedom House, plus the Democratic and Republican Institutes of the National Endowment for Democracy, which is funded by Congress and the State Department, and assumed some responsibilities from the CIA. Arguably, the chief sponsor of this event was a neoconservative think tank called the American Foreign Policy Council, which has been the most consistent supporter of QSER. Herman Perchner, its president, is Waz, or Zeritsky's best friend in Washington and an inner circle member of the Council for National Policy, which Russ mentioned, a secretive and powerful umbrella organization for right-wing activists in the United States. From 2014 until 2021, the American Foreign Policy Council led annual delegations of right-wing think tankers from the United States to Ukraine, with these trips stage managed by OUMB members from both countries, including Boris Potapenko, as you can see here. Patrons of the first QSER event in September 2000, including big corporations like RAND, a notorious militarist think tank, and Raytheon, a major U.S. defense contractor, which has reportedly doubled its profits from the war in Ukraine. In 2013, political economist Yulia Yurchenko wrote that the U.S. capital in Ukraine is represented by three lobby and interest groups, one of them being QSER, again, an OUNB front group. This year, or the following year, 
in 2014, this OUNB front group created an ad hoc committee on Ukraine in partnership with the American Foreign Policy Council. As told by the CUSER website, it was formed when the Obama administration balked at the request to arm Ukraine in 2014. And some very serious lobbying, the ad hoc committee on Ukraine helped obtain passage of a Ukraine Freedom Support Act in mid-December, authorizing the president to provide lethal weaponry to the Ukrainian armed forces. This group also took credit for spurring the creation of the Senate Ukraine Caucus. You might be wondering about German participation in QSER events. Most, if not all, of the German speakers have been associated with the CDU and or the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which co-sponsored numerous QSER events from 2007 to 2012. During that time, Nico Lange led the foundation's office in Kiev. From 2017 to 2016, he was on the steering committee of at least 10 QSER events, which I can tell you is quite a lot. More recently, he directed the Conrad Adenauer Foundation's office in Washington and has served as the chief of staff to the Federal Minister of Defense, excuse my pronunciation, Annegret Kramp Karrenbauer. Um, since 2022, he has been a senior fellow for the Zeitenwend Initiative at the Munich Security Conference. Although I could spend all day talking about the Bandera lobby in the United States, I will just mention one more thing before moving on. In 1980, the Ukrainian Liberation Front staged a coup d'etat in the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, which has remained under the thumb of the OUNB ever since. Take, for example, its current president, Andriy Fouté, on the top left. In 2004, when Fouté was an advisor to the governor of Ohio, prosecutors recommended jail time after he was ensnared in a corruption probe. According to one historian, Fouté was an attorney for Ivan uh, Demenyuk, who was convicted in Germany of being a guard at the Nazi death camp in Sobibor. All they could say was, he was there. Where's the justice? Fouté asked. Fouté's father, who oversaw the Banderite takeover of the Ukrainian Congress Committee in 1980, was identified in Russ Belant's book, Old Nazis, New Right in the Republican Party, as one of the contact points between the OUNB and the Reagan White House. It would be easy to spend a lot of time talking about the Bandera lobby in Canada, so I'll try to keep it short. Unlike in the United States, the OUNB never fully took over the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress. In fact, it seems that their influence has waned in recent years. But the Banderites are still a pillar of this umbrella organization, which the government considers to speak for the Ukrainian Canadian community. The Budushnist Credit Union, BCU, the largest Ukrainian financial institution in Canada, is a front for the OUNB. Its CEO, allegedly the Banderite land leader in Canada, is a former treasurer of the world's Ukrainian Liberation Front. The BCU Foundation, is, uh, has financed the publication of Banderite books in Ukraine, such as a collection of writings by Stepan Bandera and June 30th, 1941 by Yaroslav Stetsko, a whitewashed memoir about declaring statehood under Nazi occupation. The, um, one reason why the um, OUNB network is stronger and more confident in Canada than the United States is that the Canadian Banderites are subsidized by the state. Take, for example, the um, OUNB newspaper in Canada, which has received support for over a decade, even as it prints special commemorative issues about Stetsko and his pro-Nazi declaration of statehood. Earlier, I showed you a picture of the larger-than-life bust of Roman Shekhevich in Edmonton, Alberta. According to Per Rudling, a leading historian of the Banderites, the Roman Shekhevich Ukrainian Youth Unity Complex in Edmonton was established with significant government funding in 1973, the same year that the World's Ukrainian Liberation Front was founded. Per Rudling writes, the purpose of the complex, the OUNB press declared, was to become a blacksmith's forge, which will forge hard, unbreakable characters of the Ukrainian youth and to raise and harden a new generation of fighters for the liberation of Ukraine. 
numerous Banderite cultural centers in Canada proudly display the portraits of Bandera, Stetsko, and Shehevich with no fear of scandal or isolation. Before the Banderites sold their main, the main Ukrainian cultural center in Toronto, which served as their Canadian headquarters, it received at least $4 million from the government since 2007. The OUNB got a new headquarters building and apparently bought a hotel, the Old Mill Toronto, which they've turned, in, turned into a part-time cultural center and swanky venue for their events. For example, the so-called International Council in Support of Ukraine, World Ukrainian Liberation Front, has held special galas at the Old Mill Toronto to honor former NATO commander Wesley Clark and former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. This is how the right-wing Canadian leader concluded his remarks in early 2020. I greatly admire the work you're all doing as part of the International Council in Support of Ukraine and all the organizations that it embraces. At this event, Harper took photos with all kinds of Banderites, including Walter Zaritsky, Boris Potopenko, and Andriy Levus, who led the anti-Zelensky capitulation resistance movement. Over a decade ago, the Canadian coalition of OUNB front groups publicly demanded the enemy agents of Moscow's fifth column be deported from Ukraine. More recently, they tried to get the historian Per Rudling fired from uh, Lund University in Sweden. They're led by the League of Ukrainian Canadians, the slogan of which is, in the vanguard of Ukrainian affairs. For some time, Boris Potopenko of Warren, Michigan, served as the executive director of this organization. So on to the British Banderites. The UK was an especially important node of the international OUNB network during the Cold War. By the 1950s, the Banderites took over the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, which, like the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, essentially remains a de facto OUNB front group. Yaroslav Stetsko's direct successor as OUNB leader in the late, late 1980s was the longtime director of a private Stepan Bandera Museum in London, which shared an address with the OUNB publishing house and its international Ukrainian Central Information Service. You may remember that I said that the Center for U.S.-Ukrainian Relations in Washington was founded by the informational arm of the Ukrainian-American uh, Freedom Foundation. Well, this was the U.S. branch of the Ukrainian Central Information Service in London, which, according to the QSER website, served as an administrative midwife in the creation of the Center for U.S.-Ukrainian Relations. Any history of the center must therefore begin with a short synopsis of this organization. According to Rosalinsky Liba, the affiliated Bandera Museum in London portrays the OUNB as the main victims of the Holocaust. Today, there is the Ukrainian Information Service in London and Kiev, both of which remain under control of the Banderites. Mikola uh, Matvievsky on the left, a Greek Catholic priest, chairs the Ukrainian Information Service and, in London and is probably the British land leader of OUNB. He is, he is registered as the beneficiary of the OUNB headquarters building in Kiev, which gives credence to the rumor I heard that he is one of the top financiers of the Bandera cult. Another board member of the Ukrainian Information Service is the OUNB leader in Scotland, who read poetry at the funeral of Yaroslav Stetsko. According to this organization's website, it is partnered with the Lonsky Prison Museum, located at 1 Stepan Bandera Street in Lviv. According to John Paul Himka, this Banderite museum is devoted to the history of the repressions conducted here by the Soviet authorities and by the German authorities. But the presentation is extremely one-sided. As Per Rudling tells us, Jewish suffering is omitted. Perpetrators of anti-Jewish violence are not named. Australia. The Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organizations is yet another umbrella group that is supposed to speak for the Ukrainian community, but in fact is controlled by the OUNB. This is hard to deny, considering that its longtime chairman, Stefan Romanyev, led the OUNB from 2009 
until last December. In 2012, Romanyev said, the OUN does not divide political movements into left and right, but into pro-Ukrainian and anti-Ukrainian. Personally, I do not see left-wing left movements of pro-Ukrainian orientation in Ukraine. For years, he has been at the center of Australian-Ukrainian relations. Last year, seen here, he visited Ukraine with Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. It seemed like a symbolic choice for Romanyev to wear a Hugo Boss shirt for their photo shoot so that the word boss was emblazoned on his chest. This is not far-fetched considering Romanyev's go-to gift for Ukrainian diplomat diplomats has been jerseys of his favorite rugby team, the Essendon Bombers, with its red and black color scheme. According to his bio on the Victorian government website, Stefan Romanyev's community work has seen him become an integral link of goodwill between Australia and Ukraine. In 2017, the Russian ambassador to Australia accused Romanyev of wanting to start World War III. Romanyev delivered the official words of farewell from Ukrainian youth at Yaroslav Stetsko's funeral. Standing at your graveside, we make this sacred promise, Romanyev said. You, our unforgettable friend, are leaving behind people of the younger generation who aspire to accomplish your unfulfilled earthly mission. I bid you farewell, our dear leader, in the name of Ukrainian youth. Like other OUNB diaspora leaders, Romanyev participated in conferences of the Anti-Bolshevik Bloc of Nations and the World Anti-Communist League. Time for a new ABN, he declared in 2020. Romanyev's deputy, Yaroslav Duma, the proud son of a Waffen SS veteran, is evidently the land leader of OUNB in Australia and shares the organizations of the Ukraine Liberation Front in his country. Uh, Romanyev and Duma have both spoken at the Bendera readings, an annual event in Kiev since 2014, organized by the far-right Svoboda Party, and in particular, organized by an OUNB member who is the party's chief of political education. Something else that Romanyev and Duma share in common, they are recipients of the Order of Australia, an honor that recognizes Australian citizens and other persons for outstanding achievement and service, which is awarded by the Governor General of Australia on behalf of the British monarchy. This is um, Duma with his family at the grave of Stetsko in Munich, and this is a slideshow that Duma made maybe 15 years ago, which shows the um, OUN, the youth group you saw earlier, and the um, Ukrainian Liberation Front, all his gears working together. So less than a month after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, representatives of the German Federal Foreign Office met Stefan Romanyev to discuss German-Ukraine relations. Um, Matthias Lutenberg, the director of Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia of the German Federal Foreign Office, and Jean-Pierre uh, Froli, the special envoy for Ukraine, also met with Romanyev. Not as the OUNB leader, but in his capacity as first vice president of the Ukrainian World Congress. So Banderites have led the Ukrainian World Congress throughout the 21st century. In 2014, the Ukrainian World Congress partnered with the Atlantic Council. Stefan Romanyev, a longtime leader of the Ukrainian World Congress, organized its latest convention, which took place last week, and unsurprisingly, they re-elected him as its first vice president. For many years, Romanyev, on the left, has also chaired its International Committee for Recognition of Holodomor as Genocide. The Ukrainian World Congress president, Paul Grod, II, also re-elected, and reportedly a good friend of the uh, Canadian Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, formerly led the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress, and before that, the OUNB Youth Group in Canada. The director of the Ukrainian World Congress in Ukraine is a member of the OUNB's League of Ukrainian Canadians. And U.S. Uh, Banderite leader, Walter Zaritsky, is a member of the Ukrainian World Congress Foreign Policy Council and shared its International Scholarly Council. I could go on, but I, you get the idea. In 2021, 
the Ukrainian World Congress marked the 80th anniversary of the OUNB's restoration of Ukrainian statehood in Nazi-occupied Western Ukraine. And this year, it acknowledged the 150th birthday of Mykola Miknovsky, who coined the slogan, Ukraine for Ukrainians. Obviously, the Ukrainian World Congress has an affinity for Ukrainian nationalists. In 2019, the international organization's Banderite president, Paul Grodd, publicly warned Zelensky that crossing any red lines determined by the minority of hardliners and nationalists who did not vote for him, that crossing these red lines, quote, will have grave consequences for his presidency. That December, as Putin and Zelensky met face to face in Paris, the Ukrainian World Congress staged an anti-peace rally in Paris that was joined by prominent uh, Azov veterans and an advisor to Ukraine's powerful Minister of Internal Affairs, who was widely seen as the patron of the neo-Nazi Azov movement. In early 2020, the capitulation resistance movement and Azov um, led 10,000 nationalists in a march of patriots, which reported the reportedly culminated in chants of out with Zelensky. Meanwhile, the Banderite-led Ukrainian World Congress demanded there can be no direct no negotiations with the leaders of Russia-controlled terrorist organizations of the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. During this early phase of Zelensky's presidency, the Ukrainian World Congress and far-right radicals in Ukraine appeared to play a dangerous game of good cop, bad cop. Via the Ukrainian World Congress, the Banderites have managed to act as spokespersons for the entire global community of Ukrainians. For this reason, Romanyev and other leaders role play as diplomats and take high level meetings with government officials. Last week, Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmihal, Foreign Affairs Minister Dmitry Kuleba, and Military Intelligence Chief Kirillo Budinov all sent greetings to the Ukrainian World Congress. In 2019, the Congress held its annual general meeting in Germany and its first lobbying event in Berlin. Leaders of the Ukrainian World Congress and other Ukrainian-German organizations, accompanied by Ambassador Andriy Melnik, a notorious Bandera apologist, met with Dirk uh, Wies, a member of the Bundestag and coordinator for inter-societal cooperation with Russia, Central Asia, and the Eastern Partnership countries. They also met with Johannes uh, Schraps, Deputy Chair of the Committee on Foreign Affairs in the Bundestag, with Marielle Louise Beck, member of the Bundestag and the Green Party, Michael, Michael Siebert, Director for Eastern Europe, Russia, Southern Caucasus, and Central Asia in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, Matthias Lutenberg, Foreign Policy Advisor to the German Chancellor, Omid Nuripour, chairman of the German-Ukrainian Parliamentary Friendship Group in the Bundestag, plus a spokesperson for the AFD. So, a, now we come to Ukraine. Um, a quick history lesson on the contemporary far right in Ukraine is in order. In the 1990s, there was the OUNB's Congress of Ukrainian Nationalists, top left, the neo-Nazi Social National Party of Ukraine, and the extremist Una Unso. The latter, the Una Unso, on the far left bottom, um, sorry, uh, it was originated in a faction of the Union of Independent Ukrainian Youth, whereas the moderates reorganized as the OUNB-affiliated Ukrainian Youth Association. So from 2005 to 2015, the Ukrainian Youth Association, an OUNB front, the same that did that mar the little dance for Bandera, um, received over $400,000 from the U.S. State Department via the National Endowment for Democracy. The Congress of Ukrainian Nationalists created a hardcore paramilitary organization, Stepan Bandera's Trident, but they parted ways by the late 1990s a development that certainly would have made the OUNB more palatable in Washington. It wasn't long before something similar happened with the, with the neo-Nazi Social National Party, which was renamed uh, Svoboda in 2004, when it ditched its neo-Nazi paramilitary organization, the Patriot of Ukraine. 
But the Patriot of Ukraine continued to operate in Kharkiv under the leadership and under the leadership of Andriy Beletsky, it became a forerunner to the Azov movement. Years later, the Trident organization spearheaded the creation of the notorious right sector, which at first united the UNA, UNSO, Patriot of Ukraine, and other extremist organizations. So I'll just repeat that right sector was created, was spearheaded by what was originally a front for the OUNB. According to the investigative Ukrainian media outlet Zaborona, since its inception, Trident activities have been closely linked with the security service of Ukraine, SBU, and specifically with its future head, Valentin Nalvichenko. Nalvichenko, known to be a friend of the Trident leader who founded Right Sector, became the SBU director not for the first time in 2014 to 2015. He appointed two OUNB members as deputy chief of the SBU, including Andriy Levus, the future leader of the capitulation resistance movement. For whatever reason, Levus follows me on Twitter. Um, according to Zaborona, Levus was associated for many years with Nalvichenko. After the victory of the revolution, 2014, he became deputy head of the SBU for six months responsible for work with the volunteer battalions that were being created at that time. This, of course, would have included the Azov Battalion and other extreme right formations. But back to Zaborona. According to his own Facebook posts, Levus also led the Donbass guerrillas who carried out acts of sabotage against the Russian military and local separatists, including bombings. So this is Levus on the right with Stephen Harper. Levus with Romanyev at the Center for U.S.-Ukraine Relations in Washington. And this is a video that Levus released a few days after Russia invaded Ukraine, announcing that he's the deputy leader of OUNB. Um, Andriy Levus, a fan of the fascist ideologue Dmitry Donsov, was recruited into the OUNB via the Youth Nationalist Congress, a militant anti-Semitic group founded by the OUNB in early 2001, less than half a year after the first CUSER conference in Washington. The symbol of the Ukrainian, uh, sorry, the symbol of the Youth Nationalist Congress is the Donsovian beast, a hybrid lion-wolf hedgehog, which represents nobility, bravery, and intransigence. Many, if not most, of the middle-aged OUNB leaders in Ukraine today were groomed in this far-right youth organization which became a vehicle for the Banderites to lead the capitulation resistance movement against Zelensky in 2019 to 2022. As I said, just days after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, Levus announced that he was the deputy leader of OUNB and commander of the capitulation resistance movement. And so here you have um, an anti-Semitic play World War II themed anti-Semitic play where um, someone dressed as an insurgent is pointing a machine gun at the characters who are supposed to be Jews and they're saying, we will build Ukraine, greater Ukraine. So for many years, Andriy Levus has been a right-hand man to the far-right politician Andriy Perubi. Many in the audience will already know that Perubi, as a founder of the Patriot of Ukraine, led the Maidan Self-Defense Forces, which provided the muscle for the so-called Maidan Revolution in 2014. Perubi subsequently chaired the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine and served as the, sp as the Speaker of Ukrainian Parliament. He is now a leader of former President Petro Poroshenko's right-wing political party, European Solidarity. Levus was Perubi's deputy commander during the 2014 revolution and remained an assistant of his in Parliament. After the coup d'etat in February 2014, Alexander Sitch, an ideologist of the Svoboda Party, became Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine for several months. Sitch is an OUNB member who managed Slava Stetska's first parliamentary campaign in the 1990s. At some point, apparently in the 2000s, Sitch served as the Deputy Chairman of OUNB at a time when the land leader in Ukraine was a veteran of the Waffen-SS. Meanwhile, Sitch became the deputy chairman of Svoboda for ideological issues and directed the Stepan Bandera Center for National Revival 
an OUNB front run out of its headquarters building in Kiev. In 2008, this organization hosted a roundtable to unite Ukraine's national patriotic forces ahead of parliamentary elections. Speaking at this event, another deputy leader of Svoboda argued that their party was best suited for an electoral breakthrough and observed that, had, that it had already united prominent representatives of the OUNB and OUNM, naming Oleksandr Sich and the Melnikite leader. The Maidan Revolution, as it's called, brought other Banderites into the halls of power. As I mentioned earlier, Serhi Kvit, a future leader of the Capitulation Resistance Movement, became the Minister of Education. Kvit, a former captain in the paramilitary Trident Organization, is known in Ukraine as the author of an admiring biography, uh, known as the author of an admiring biography of the Ukrainian fascist thinker Dmitry Donsov and as a Svoboda supporter according to historians Per Rudling and Jared McBride. In December 2016, months after he left his post in Poroshenko's government, Kvit was one of three OUNB representatives to meet with the OUNM leadership to discuss their potential reunification. Kvit is now president of the National University of Kiev Mohiva Academy, a top university in Ukraine, which under his leadership banned all communication in Russian earlier this year. Um, in 1981, an 18-year-old Ulana Saprun spoke at Yaroslav Stetsko Day, uh, or at a Yaroslav Stetsko Day event at Bogdan Fedorak's Ukrainian Cultural Center in Warren, Michigan, to honor the 40th anniversary of Stetsko's pro-Nazi proclamation in Lviv. Her family's foundation is a financial supporter of the Center for U.S.-Ukrainian Relations in Washington. From 2016 to 2019, Saprun served as the acting healthcare minister of Ukraine. In 2020, according to journalist Alexei Kuzmenko, she claimed, the Russian world is a threat that's scarier than coronavirus. Meanwhile, the Atlantic Council warned Kiev, any harassment of Saprun would more than raise eyebrows in Washington and Europe. Before entering the government, she ran an OUNB-affiliated medical initiative called Patriot Defense, which was created by yet another OUNB front group in New York City. The Ukrainian World Congress subsequently made her its director of humanitarian initiatives, from which she piggybacked to the healthcare ministry. Following her dismissal from Zelensky's government, Ulana Saprun also threw her weight behind the capitulation resistance movement. Her husband, Marco Saprun, a Canadian Banderite, is the principal host of Stop Fake, a propagandistic counter disinformation outlet. From at least 2014 to 2017, the Saprunes lived in a Kiev apartment owned by the treasurer of the Ukrainian American Freedom Foundation. I'm sorry, by the secretary of the Ukrainian American Freedom Foundation, the financial arm of OUNB in the United States. Their Banderite landlord, used to be married to a leader of the far-right Una Unso. The Saprunes themselves have proven to be friends of neo-Nazis in Ukraine, including the violent hate group C-14, which is known to have perpetrated anti-Roma pogroms in Ukraine. Once at an OUNB summer camp in Ukraine, Marko Saprun appeared alongside Arseniy Bivudub, the leader of the neo-Nazi band Sukira Peruna, which has songs like Six Million Words of Lies. According to Alexei Kuzmenko, Bilodub suggested that he and Marco Saprun once became brothers in a ritual that involved bloodletting. Finally, we come to Volodymyr Vyotrovich, who this year announced that he is satisfied with the banderization of Ukraine. Vyotrovich, dubbed the historian whitewashing Ukraine's past by Foreign Policy magazine, is an OUNB member who served as the memory czar of Ukraine from 2014 to 2019. And he was the architect of Ukraine's decommunization laws. As told by historian Tariq Cyril Amar, these laws, quote, leave no room for either nationalism's victims in the past or alternatives to nationalism in the present and future. In 2014, the OUNB and like-minded nationalists seized control of the state's Ukrainian Institute of National Memory and the archives of the Security Service of Ukraine. 
They accomplished this thanks to yet another OUNB front group in Ukraine, the Center for Research of the Liberation Movement, which has its offices located above the Lonsky Prison Museum in Lviv. It's also funded by the diaspora. The Banderites so thoroughly penetrated the Institute of National Memory that they still play an important role almost four years after Vyotrovich's dismissal. Volodymyr uh, Tivashak, the current deputy director of the Institute, is a contributor to the OUNB newspaper, Way of Victory, and is part of the Ukrainian Studies of Strategic Research, the organization that organizes the annual Bandera ratings in Kiev. Andreas Umland, a German political scientist, has mocked our event on the Bandera complex, but it is not simply out of pettiness that I want to quote an article of his titled, The Ukrainian Government's Memory Institute Against the West, which he promoted on Twitter with the hashtag BanderaCult. The Institute's staff, he wrote in 2017, is closely linked to a marginal yet industrious Galician NGO called Center for Research into the Liberation Movement. The main aim of the center's significant book publishing and mass media activity is to further an apologetic public opinion of the OUNB and hagiographic official discourse around its wartime leaders, Stepan Bandera, Roman Shehevich, Yurislav Stetsko, and others. The Institute of National Memory has coupled its current decommunization campaign with a comprehensive nationalization and partial banderization drive in public remembrance and official discourse. It is actively supported by the Center for Research of the Liberation Movement, this OUNB front, that presents the wartime Ukrainian ultranationalist movement as the pinnacle of Ukrainian patriotism and love of freedom. While the Institute of National Memory directly influences Ukraine's executive, the Center for Research of the Liberation Movement exerts impact on Ukraine's legislative process as a member of the famous alliance of Ukraine civil society organizations, the reanimation package of reforms devoted to drafting and pushing through reform laws in the uh, Ukrainian parliament. The reanimation package of reforms, or RPR coalition, the largest and most visible reform network in Ukraine, has been supported by the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, Global Affairs Canada, the EU delegation to Ukraine, and other high-level donors. In 2018, the RPR established a transatlantic task force for Ukraine with the German Marshall Fund of the United States. The Center for Research of the Liberation Movement is a member of the RPR coalition. And from 2016 to 2019, so was the OUNB's far-right Youth Nationalist Congress. For a time, uh, Vladimir Vyotrovich, the memories are, his wife was on the RPR board of directors. A critic of this reform network once said, many RPR activists only use the RPR brand to boost their personal capital, to meet foreign diplomats, get media opportunities, get invited to international conferences, or win prestigious fellowships in the United States. For some, RPR is a ticket to power corridors where they can make friends with government officials or politicians and maybe get elected to the Ukrainian parliament during the next election. When it came to the field of national memory reform, national memory reform, youth policy reform, and healthcare reform, the Bandera lobby provided the RPR with many of its experts, so-called experts. In 2016, Vox Ukraine ranked an OUNB-affiliated politician as the top number three reformist in Ukrainian parliament, with number one being the leader of a far-right youth group that originated in the OUNB's Youth Nationalist Congress. By 2018, the RPR drafted re legislation co-sponsored by OUNB leader Oleg Medunitsa to rehabilitate veterans of the OUN and its Ukrainian insurgent army. This Western-backed network has also put pressure on Kiev to, quote, enshrine the national memory policy, that is, Banderite memory policy, as an integral and obligatory element of state policy, such as economic, educational, security policy, etc. In the summer of 2019, Z Zelensky agreed to discuss the Steinmeier formula, a simplified version of the Minsk agreements, 
to resolve the civil war in eastern Ukraine. That was the spark for the OUNB to launch the capitulation resistance movement in November. We will not allow surrender, they declared. It seems very likely that they had some kind of support from certain circles in Washington. Around this time, Michael Carpenter, seen on the left, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and foreign policy advisor to Joe Biden, described the Steinmeier formula as, quote, the primary threat to Ukraine internally right now. Meanwhile, Andre Levus, OUNB, said, I've known Michael Carpenter for a long time. They probably first met at one of Walter Zaritsky's Center for U.S.-Ukraine Relations events in Washington, D.C. At one of these conferences in 2018, Carpenter dissed the ultra-uber-cautious Obama administration, members of which are afraid of their own shadow. According to the Atlantic Council, the capitulation resistance movement was a democratic movement, um, but this could hardly be further from the truth. This was a far-right movement that threatened to kill the president of Ukraine. Dmitry Yorosh, the founder of Right Sector, appointed as an advisor to Ukraine's top general, Valery Zaluzhny, in November 21, 21, declared soon after the 2019 election, Zelensky said in his inaugural speech that he was ready to lose his ratings, popularity, position. No, he would lose his life. He will hang on some tree on the main street of Kiev if he betrays Ukraine and those people who died during the revolution and the war. The capitulation resistance movement amplified this message. One of its neo-Nazi coordinators publicly warned, if Zelensky does not stop, the fate of Gaddafi awaits him. As the late Russia expert Stephen F. Cohen explained in the fall of 2019, shortly after the launch of this resistance movement, Zelensky won an enormous mandate to make peace. So that means he has to negotiate with Vladimir Putin. But Ukrainian fascists have said that they will remove and kill Zelensky if he continues along this line of negotiating with Putin. His life is being threatened, literally, by a quasi-fascist movement in Ukraine. So Zelensky can't go forward with full peace negotiations with Russia, with Putin, unless America has his back. Maybe that won't be enough, but unless the White House encourages this diplomacy, Zelensky has no chance of negotiating an end to the war. So the stakes are enormously high. The capitulation resistance movement listed the address of the OUNB headquarters in Kiev as its own, and a majority of its coordination council consisted of Banderites. And when I mean Banderites, I don't mean followers, just followers of Stepan Bandera, but people who are connected one way or another to the OUNB network. At the same time, it was part of a broad... The capitulation resistance movement was part of a broader anti-Zelensky movement led by Azov under the banner of no capitulation. A year later at the 2020 Kiev Security Forum, which had close ties to the Banderite-led resistance movement, the Atlantic Council had held a session on what the U.S. presidential election would mean for Ukraine. Michael Carpenter, the managing director of the Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement, delivered the final speech at the event. A few months earlier, Carpenter, a foreign policy advisor to the Biden campaign, promised that Joe Biden, if elected, would help Ukraine, quote, beat back this, growing by the way, Russian covert influence within its politics. Before Carpenter spoke, Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council asked her boss, John Herbst, a leader of the Atlantic Council and a former ambassador of the United States to Ukraine under George W. Bush, does it really matter for Ukraine if Trump or Biden is elected? Since we see Ukraine and the Zelensky administration increasingly turning inward and less interested in what the West has to say. Herring and Herbst are frequent speakers at the Center for U.S.-Ukrainian Relations in Washington who are on a first-name basis with the U.S. land leader of OUNB. In response to the question, Ambassador Herbst confidently predicted, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, Zelensky has a choice. He can bow down to Kremlin dictates, or he can pursue policies which ensure Western support. And when it's that choice, the decision, I think, is almost inevitable. Well, it seems that he was right, because a few months later, hoping to curry favor with the incoming Biden administration, as his own approval rating hit rock bottom, 
Zelensky finally decided to pursue policies which ensure Western support and beat back this growing, by the way, Russian covert influence within its politics, to quote Michael Carpenter again. I'm talking about Zelensky's decision to shut down, quote-unquote, pro-Russian media in Ukraine. As the Ukrainian writer Peter Koroteev has explained, these sanctions, quote, meant the scrapping of the Kremlin strategy, which it had been trying to implement in Ukraine since 2015. In hindsight, at that point, it seems that Putin's decision to invade Ukraine, which he apparently made quite soon, was also almost inevitable. For all I know, by the time this war ends, the OUNB could be practically irrelevant. If you want, ask me about the Azov lobby. So it's not that I think the Bandera lobby is pulling all the strings of the conflict in Ukraine, but it's a very important piece of the puzzle, which the whole world seems to not even realize we are missing, to help us explain how we have come to the precipice of World War III. Just a couple weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, the Russian journalist Leonid Rogozin observed, while downplaying the risk of a Russian offensive and even reprimanding the West for sowing panic, the Ukrainian leadership appears preoccupied, preoccupied with a different threat, that of a coup. Rogozin made clear that he was referring to the capitulation resistance movement, which he described as a radical street force dedicated to toppling Zelensky and a, a paramilitary force associated with the nationalist opposition that coalesced around former President Petro Poroshenko. And as Rogozin would tell you, this movement stems from Ukraine's Youth Nationalist Congress, the youth branch of OUNB, the Banderites who survived the Cold War in North America. Personally, I am convinced that after this experience, and when the United States and Britain do not offer support to end the bloodshed as soon as it started, that Zelensky made another almost inevitable decision to become the dangerous leader that he is today. Thank you.